Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you've followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello and welcome to our show today, listeners. This is Anne, your host. And in today's episode, I want to talk to you about mental fitness, grieving a loss, and with the support of positive intelligence. I'm going to be introducing you to something that you may find rather alarming or fascinating. But anyway, we're going to be talking about the saboteurs and the sage. So I do hope you'll stay with me as we continue our journey into healing. Before I do, I'd like to acknowledge listeners. If you've been with me on this journey for a while, I want to thank you for being with me. I love reading your comments and reviews and hope that we will continue to be together. We know just how lone our grief can have us feel. And by having these conversations, I hope you'll begin to see and feel a little less alone. You will also know that I'm passionate about learning and I've had the privilege of learning from our guests and hearing their stories as they have shared their hows. Hopefully you too have gained some tips and support and discovered ways that you too can navigate your own loss and your grief. I've been doing this now for over a decade. It feels like yesterday and I've taken so many courses. I've delved into psychology and neuropsychology regarding grief and trauma and all my learning has helped me be a better coach, better facilitator, and hopefully a podcast host. Another benefit of all this learning is I get to share it with you, which is something I so enjoy doing. I guess I'm a teacher at heart. Indeed, our topic is about grief and healing, and I'm truly excited to share this program that I've been involved in for over a year. I've discovered amazing impacts in many areas of my own life that I've gotten from this program with regards to health, relationships, my productivity. And if you're somebody who's involved in sports, it can also really help you. Hopefully, you too, by the end, will see all the benefits as I explain what the heck it is and more about these saboteurs and how they actually affect our healing. When I was first introduced to this program, I got really excited because I saw very early on how it could support and help my clients not only grieve well, it would prepare them for many of the challenges they may face moving through their grief and moving on to a new life, whatever that may look like. It also answered one of my questions that took me on this quest all those years ago, is why some people get caught in their grief for way longer that they miss out on their lives. To me, this was the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I could add to my toolbox. And as I mentioned, it answered so many of my own questions around why some heal and others don't. I was actually told this when I was going uh, on my own grief journey. 
that you don't get over your grief. You never heal. Well, I'm sorry. I have a nursing background and I have seen way too many amazing things occur with the patients that I nursed. And I thought, if grief is normal and natural, can we not heal our hearts? And as I mentioned before, this began my journey of discovery. And as you know, I love sharing it with you. When you hear what I'm about to share, it's my sincere hope that it will open you up to new ideas and potential possibilities, especially if you're grieving. So before I begin, what do I mean about mental fitness? Let me explain by using this analogy. Many of us are into fitness these days. It seems to be a buzzword, whether you are or not. I'm certain you'll get what I'm about to say. Imagine your mental fitness as a skill to climb hills of life's challenges. You may be able to handle medium level challenges with a decent amount of stress. However, when a death occurs, it's like facing a mountain of challenges. This loss can understandably leave you feeling overwhelmed and stressed. And it's important to acknowledge that that's okay. No one has taught us how to navigate such immense challenges. Instead of blaming ourselves, let's consider that the mountain may be too big for us to handle right now. That's why we often say, when you're grieving a loss, it's good to have support. Discovering ways to enhance your mental fitness begins with cultivating awareness, recognizing and strengthening your mental fitness muscles. How do you do that? Well, this program that I'm about to share with you Positive Intelligence, it offers valuable tools to guide individuals through the grieving process, empowering them to navigate those difficult times with so much more compassion and resilience. Grief, I'm certain we can all agree, is intensely personal experience, and we don't underestimate the difficulty you can go through to navigate it, whether you've lost a loved one, a relationship, a job, or a dream, the process of grieving can be overwhelming. And we know grieving is just plain hard work. You've possibly also recognized that time doesn't heal either. There are so many misconceptions, myths, and beliefs you may have. And hopefully with this discussion, you'll gain additional awarenesses of this bewildering thing we call grief and why indeed it's called hard work. Shall we begin? Well, as you can see, or hear in my voice, I'm excited to be sharing this information with you. And it is indeed called positive intelligence. It's truly been a game changer for me. The founder, Shazad Shamin, is a Stanford lecturer, and he created this program from many years and extensive research, interviews with over a million people, CEOs and their families, Stanford students, to name but a few. Through their research, they discovered 10 types of behaviors we now get to lovingly call saboteurs. Or if you're familiar with internal family systems, they're known as protectors. So as you can see, this body of work isn't something Mickey Mouse. It's not something I've made up. And I love the fact that there's been so much research uh, done on it. And they've been able to use this research and I guess boil it down to 10 types of behaviors. Now, I'm sure I've got your attention. Well, I hope I do. One of the main characters and is the main 
character in our inner drama we call the judge. Oh boy, does this character love to criticize. It doesn't just stop at criticizing ourselves. It extends to others and to even events. It's incredibly judgmental and makes sure we know it and others. And when we don't comply with its incessant criticism, it enlists other characters from this cast, such as the avoider, controller, hyperachiever, hyperrational, hypervigilant, pleaser, restless, stickler, or victim. As we go through this, you may begin to recognize some of these behaviors in yourself. Many of you may have been woken up at 3 a.m. by a pesky, nagging voice in your head that may be telling you how stupid you are and why didn't you do such and such. <gasps> what if we're going to fail? Sure, you can relate. You're possibly aware of this voice that we term inner critic. It can be so darn mean to us that if we spoke that way to a friend, I don't think we'd have many friends, yet we continue to do it to ourselves. Kind of strange, isn't it? We continue, as I mentioned, to berate and beat ourselves up on a daily basis. Often, we don't even pay attention. We're so used to it and we don't give it another thought. I know I certainly didn't. Okay, so we all have the judge and the inner critic is part of the judge. The only difference is the judge criticizes others and situations such as I can only be happy when. I can only be happy when I stop grieving. I can never be happy. The person I loved has died. Then the judge teams up with our other saboteurs, as I mentioned. We often have about three that we rely on, and they're usually ready to support him. Positive intelligence has a free quiz in case you're curious. You can take it and discover what's behind some of your saboteur behaviors. According to my results, I'm going to share. You're going to love this. They are the avoider, the people pleaser, and restless. These characters can create such angst. Once I became aware of how they operated, I say it was eye opening. It explained so much. Why do I have so much angst? when I'm about to record a podcast, for instance, why do I take on so much? Well, the avoider, I can tell you, I hate conflict and will do my best to avoid it in the hopes that it'll just disappear. But we know that's not the case. Anyway, more on that later. As a pleaser, I could constantly give and give and give, totally neglecting my own self-care and my needs as I take care of others and please them first. And understanding the restless, oh my goodness, this gave me so much clarity why I have a problem completing things. I have what's called bright, shiny object syndrome. Many of you may be aware of it within yourself. Oh, squirrel. Oh, oh, this. Oh, let's do that now. There's a reason for it. We often feel very uncomfortable with the emotion that we're experiencing. I know a grief coach admitting to that. <laughs> It's one of these lifelong journeys, and I'm sure you'll have more insights as we go along. So if you're anxious to discover yours, I promise I will provide the link later on so that you can take the quiz. It only takes five minutes, 
And I hope you will find it as enlightening and it may help you to understand yourself a little more. Before I go on, though, I just want to share with you, if you're thinking, oh, this is completely hokey, I'm going to stop listening to her right now. I would ask you to wait and discover if this is your hyper-rational talking or your controller. Hmm, interesting, eh? Bear with me, please. But wait, there's a lot more to this story. Alongside the saboteurs, we have the sage. This is the part of us that's been with us since birth. This is our authentic self. It's a pure being before the world got its claws or grips into us. As young children, we'd pick up messages and stories, especially if we sensed our behavior wasn't pleasing to others or if we felt in danger. It's our quest then to feel safe. So we would tell ourselves, we got to be good. I better not cry. I can't make a fuss. Nobody will love me if I do that. We assume that we wouldn't be liked if we showed our anger or that it was weak to let others see our vulnerabilities. We heard phrases like, big boys don't cry. You have to think of others. It's selfish to think of only yourself. And so we internalized all of these stories and messages, trying to fit in and conform to the only world we knew. All these messages were piled on top of our pure, authentic selves. But you know what? There is good news. This part of us is resilient and is available to us. It's pure love, capable of experiencing empathy and compassion, and doesn't take things personally. It recognizes our values and taps into our creativity, our curiosity. It's the part of us that knows we are worthy and we are more than enough. What I love about this, as I've already said, it signs back. And interestingly, they've been using MRI scans and the researchers now understand better where our saboteurs live. It's mainly in the survival part of the brain and the sage resides in the other side where we usually feel the more pleasant emotions. The research data is also borne out and can be found in many areas of positive psychology, neuropsychology, sports psychology, or cognitive behavior therapy. For anyone that's interested in diving deeper into all of what I'm saying. Now, if you're grieving, why would this be of interest to you? Let me go through some scenarios to give you a better understanding. The most interesting part was when I learned that grief is about honoring and loving the person. And we're certainly not dishonoring them if we feel joy or happiness during our grieving moments or if we notice our pain has subsided, or we're not thinking of them as often. If we're in pain, that is often where our fears live. Any negative emotions is usually one or more of our saboteurs lurking. Of course, when you're in the midst of grieving, it is extremely painful overwhelming, and it can feel you leaving helpless and hopeless. You may long for the person you've lost or yearn to get back to the life as you knew it. With everything happening, it can understandably have you feel a victim in a way. And indeed you are. When you think about it, you've been robbed and this isn't something you asked for or wanted. It's natural that you'd want to throw a frustrated 
child temper tantrum. You have every right. And I'm not negating your feelings. I truly get it. These initial feelings are completely normal if you're just beginning your grief journey. You may find that these intense emotions gradually subside only to regain a little later. However, for many of us, we've noticed the intensity lessens. And I like to think of our emotions serving us as guideposts, guiding us on this journey. But that's a bigger discussion for another day. Okay, let's get back to our victim mode. You may be waiting to, to be rescued. You feel helpless or hopeless. You may begin to feel very alone and believe that you're the only one feeling this way and that no one understands what it's like. We often want to push away those feelings or push away th those people that we don't want to interact with. Why? Why bother reaching out? They don't understand. No one cares. You may be telling yourself. Or you may be finding yourself telling yourself stories as a way to blame or shame yourself or even others. You probably are familiar with this. If only I hadn't left the room to get a coffee. If only I'd have done this or known sooner. I could have done fill in the blanks. My loved one would still be here. If I hadn't have been so selfish, I could have seen them more. I didn't even get to say goodbye. So we begin judging ourselves. Others are even a higher power. This is the saboteur judge at its best. And it shares with us these stories that can keep us ruminating and keeping us stuck in those feelings as we're attempting to find our way out or to find answers. The judge may enlist the controller to add weight to what it's saying. And we find ourselves holding tighter and tighter onto things, controlling everything, controlling things that just can't be controlled because of our fear. Or for others, the avoider might step in. I don't want to be told I'm not grieving right. I don't want to feel this way. I'm just not going to deal with it. I'm, I know I'll just keep myself busy. This isn't a good time for me to grieve. So you push the thoughts and feelings down as they arise. You, in essence, avoid dealing with them. Or you feel you'll bring others down if you allow others to see you crying. Our grief is sitting on top of all of this and it's just waiting for a moment to burst out and it will do so at the most inopportune moment. You may even have experienced this. You may find yourself in a flood of tears, unable to control them. This is what you've been dreading and you knew was going to happen. The controller in us has a field day and comes alive, telling us more stories about how we've messed up and spoiled things for others including ourselves, giving us more opportunity for the avoider to not want to be dealing with any of this grief. The avoider may see, I'm just going to keep doing. I'm just going to get busy again, and this won't happen. The grief indeed will begin to surface. You discover the red slash saboteur has entered. The restless doesn't like to feel emotions and does what it can to move away, find something else, a distraction. Go make a cup of tea. Let's focus on something else to do anything rather than allow the feelings to surface. They may even run away, change jobs, relationships, move countries. 
all to avoid feeling the depths of the grief. They just don't want the feelings to find them. We then have the thoughtful pleaser who feels that they don't want to make others feel bad because of what we're going through and will appear happy. You may have done this yourself or know others that have. They're all light and love because they want others to feel okay and they don't want to be responsible for bringing anybody down. Ask them how they're feeling and they'll immediately say, without skipping a beat, they're fine. All's good here. Then we have the hypervigilant who is always alerted and on guard. They've been caught out. This happened and they don't want it happening again. It could happen to them. It could happen to any more of their loved ones. So they continually scan the environment for danger or for whatever disaster may befall them. They become even more fearful, full of stress, on high alert. And so they are exhausted constantly because of it. I did allude to the hyper-rational. It's a very interesting one. They may decide, what's the problem? We don't need all the emotions. We can figure it out. We know what we need to do. So let's get to work. We'll just make a list of everything that's required. I got this. I can figure it out. We know from the research that very often the hyper-rational is, isn't in touch with their emotions. And as we know, grief is all about emotions and much more. It affects our whole body. So when we find ourselves in the grips of grief, it can inadvertently lead us to push away our pain and those who wish to support us. So we isolate, we feel alone. However, it's crucial to remember grieving alone isn't recommended. You know, we're tribal beings. We long for connection the need to be seen and heard and surrounded by individuals who understand. That's what many of us are craving. We may not realize it, but it is. This is where support groups, grief coaches, therapists can provide invaluable guidance until you regain your footing once more. Now that you have a clearer understanding of how the saboteurs operate, let's transition into the domain of the sage. The sage represents that empathetic and compassionate part of ourselves, the one that extends kindness not only to others, but also to our own grieving hearts. In sage mode, we develop more compassion towards ourselves and our emotions. We allow ourselves to be vulnerable and messy, demonstrating to others how to be present during the overwhelming pain of grieving. We grant ourselves permission to experience all the emotions without the fear of being trapped in perpetual sorrow. We dismiss the judgment that feelings, moments of happiness negate the love. We dismiss the judgments that have us feeling those moments of happiness that we often feel negates the love we had for those we lost. We understand that joy is acceptable and that others' expectations of how we should appear doesn't define our grieving process. We no longer concern ourselves with questions like, why aren't you over it yet? Shouldn't you be better by now? Instead, the focus is on healing at our own pace, embracing the wisdom of grief 
along the way. Our truth lies within the sage, while the saboteurs weave stories around us. Though it may sound peculiar, rest assured, we don't have a split personality. These facets emerged in our childhood. Their aim was to keep us safe. When we identify the presence of the saboteurs, we can catch ourselves recounting tales of self-blame, guilt, and shame. It's deceiving to think we control these emotions, for in reality, we cannot. Grief, even when we believe otherwise, remains beyond our influence. Grief is truly a testament to love and a path to honor. It's in the pain that fear takes its root. I'm certain you're discovering the benefits of knowing all this. And you're beginning to see how these behaviors can actually hinder your healing. I, for one, recognize the need to be and sit with your grief. It is an important function. And I recommend it to my clients as I introduce bits and pieces of this work to them. If you've been grieving for a while and are at the stage where you're wondering what's next, then this is a great time to be learning. You now have more brain capacity. This program would be a benefit to you in helping you build your mental muscles, which would allow you to navigate the world, which we know is stressful at the best of times. You would have new awareness and you would find your stress is lessening. Okay, I promised to give you the link so that you could discover for yourself and take the quiz. It's positive intelligence slash saboteurs.com. And once you take the quiz, you'll be given a, a detailed description of the saboteurs that may be lurking for you. And if you're interested in incorporating positive intelligence on your healing journey, or even considering it more, I would invite you to deepen your understanding and how you too can utilize the saboteurs and sage perspective so that you can fortify your emotional intelligence and regain control of your mindset. I'd like you then to connect for a complimentary call. Simply visit my website and click on the button to access my calendar where you'll find a convenient date and time. I promise there's no selling. I just want to serve. I want you to see how learning this program can be of benefit to you. And if you don't agree with it, that's totally okay. Again, no pressure. I'm purely giving you this information to add to the toolbox as you continue your grieving journey. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at Understanding Grief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.